This man, Ted Field, called, or his representative called, and he said it was a man who wanted to start a record company, and that was Interscope Records. Wow. And so I joined him, and this other guy, John McLean, joined him, and Jimmy Iovine joined him, and the four of us set out to start Interscope Records, and that was in 1990. I am a guy friend that's named Miriam Suge Knight. And Easy said, you know this guy Suge Knight? I said, yeah. People that got killed on Suge Watch is responsible for that. He says, well, I'm going to kill him. You never know what you have to do until you walk in that dude's shoes. And you know something? I should have let him kill him. And I'm not lying for him. You don't know about the pressure on him from a little short man of another ethnicity. Real head of death for records, a guy named Dave Kenner, a white lawyer. With a cigar in his mouth and smell like uh, Old Spice Cologne. Wow. He know if he a funky yellow motherfucker. I, I interviewed a DOC. So what was your beef with him? How did it feel to have your own number one record? Gold record. He brought in Suge Knight. I think I might have started to believe a lot of the stuff that people were saying. And, and that was probably the beginning of the end, so to speak, really. Basically, he was the one that brought Suge around into, the, into what eventually became Death Row. Yeah. This is dedicated to the niggas that was down from day one. Welcome to Death Row. You know what I'm Sugar saying? Baby me, man. And he set himself up on the Suge Knight propaganda. He was a mini for sure. A yes, man. And and he thought he was going to come out on the other end. And then at the end of the day, he threw me away like, like pretty much everybody that, 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 that had his back. Before the, the whole Death Row thing, um, there was... The Vanilla Ice thing. Yeah, that's when it was Fern Hill Records. Yeah. Were you around? Yeah. Okay. Originally, it was Future Shock Records, right? No. Because well, DOC was involved. Well, that's, that's DOC shit. We, when, when, when DOC came, Shook started pulling them, uh -huh. we had Fern Hill Records. Fern Hill. That okay. others th didn't go nowhere because Tom Klein wanted Shook to live do Fern Hill records. Okay. Were there any artists on Fern Hill at all? Or? Uh, on now one of them? No. Not. I don't remember the dates, but, you know, the, there came a point in time in this, you know, uh, late 80s, maybe early 90s, probably late 80s. Shug came in one day and he said, um, Mr. Griffey, I've been trying to get together to meet with you. And I have a client who has written all these these songs on a on a guy named Vanilla Ice and he's not being paid. Can you help us get paid? So he brought in Mario Johnson, you know, uh, uh, PKA Chocolate. Uh, we had a joint venture deal with Sony, um, and it covered music and publishing. And so I called up the head of Sony's publishing company and said, I found somebody that I think has written hit songs in Vanilla Ice. It's on Millions of Records. And those are songs that we can get a piece of. It's a great make a deal. But there's still the whole thing up in the air of he hasn't been paid for Ice Ice Baby. So then there was the incident at the hotel room with Suge Knight and Vanilla Ice. First time I met Suge Knight was at a restaurant in L.A. called Palm. Palm Restaurant. And uh, I was sitting there eating. And they pretty much grabbed my bodyguard and pulled him out and sat down next to me right there and started talking to me. How you doing? Uninvited. Totally uninvited. I didn't even know him. See him again? Sure did. Saw him again a few months later. He did the same thing. Just kind of showed up to me, said hi, and then left. And still thinking, well, wow, this guy knows where I'm at at all times. How does he know where I'm at? Knight told us before he knew we had talked with Van Winkle that it was all very friendly. He agreed to everything. It wasn't a problem. And Wait, he agreed to everything? I mean, you know, he said the guy wrote the song, and he didn't have a problem with it. He said, That's might not what he says at all. I had my bodyguards who had guns, and uh, they had their people which had guns, and they had us outpowered and outnumbered. Talking publicly about it for the first time, 
Van Winkle describes a terrifying night in his suite at a Beverly Hills hotel when he says Suge Knight showed up with six other men. Roughed one of my bodyguards up. They roughed everybody else and my whole entourage up. Suge took me out on the balcony, started talking to me personally. On the balcony? On the balcony. High above? Like 15 floors. He had me look over the edge, show me how high I was up there. Were you scared? <laughs> I was very scared. On the balcony, Van Winkle says Suge Knight told him to sign over points from the song to a man named Mario Lavelle Johnson. Who is Mario Lavelle Johnson? His name is listed. That's the guy that Suge Knight brought over there that is an acquaintance of mine that had nothing to do with that song. You signed over the rights? I signed over the rights to him so he, that Suge and them could get paid for it. How much were those points worth? About four million, three million, anywhere between there. Three to four million dollars. How does that sound? It sounds like what occurs in <laughs> other police reports involving you. Again and again, there's a Come pattern, on, Mr. Man. Knight, where you do that. That's not true. But in our primetime investigation, we found one court case after another in which Knight has pleaded guilty to criminal charges involving vicious assaults, beatings, a pistol whipping, and on and on. Well, well, I wasn't there. You weren't there. But it sounds like fiction to me. Okay. And the reason I say it is because we ultimately had to hire a lawyer to sue EMI. Okay. Initially, EMI refused to grant our request that we split the publishing. We actually hired a lawyer to sue EMI. Okay. Uh, and that's how we ended up getting the money from EMI for the publishing. Okay. So you guys ultimately won that lawsuit. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't win the lawsuit. I mean, it, we, we got ready to file a lawsuit, and then they saw the evidence, and they said, okay, you're right. So, so this story is very fuzzy. Um, you know, Vanilla Ice said that, you know, Suge came over and basically... Suge didn't own shit to that. Suge went to him and pretty much punked him out of his shit with chocolate. Yeah. Saying that he wrote the shit the whole nine. Ice Ice Baby. Yeah, didn't have nothing to do with it. So Chocolate had nothing to do with that song? No. He took the contract to Vanilla Ice, made him sign it, and they gave him a check for it. Were you there when that happened? Yeah, I was with you. The, the Vanilla Ice thing happened. Yeah. You know, and then, and then there's the Ruthless thing. Was there anything in between where Shug was basically strong-arming people for contracts and so forth in between. I mean, it was a lot of dirty shit going on. I mean, we was taking studio music. We was... we was Terrorizing the industry, pretty much. Exactly. Okay. And everybody was scared. Sure, we was just getting into it. We didn't have... We didn't have no artists, no groups. Chocolate wasn't doing nothing. <laughs> I mean, just a lot of people sitting around. When he... When Shug went and got DOC, this is what we doing. And he told Doc that. So when he told Doc, I want you to come over here with us, now we sitting at the table saying, we finna go and get Dre, Michelle, we going up to Ruthless Records, we doing Woop the Woop, and that's what we did. When did you first see Suge coming around? I first see Suge coming around when we were, I think, I wanna say, we were about to get ready to go on, on the tour to London, when we did London. No, actually, matter of fact, it was when we were shooting Beautiful But Deadly, the formula, on Doc. We started noticing that everywhere we went, we saw Suge. And then the, the video shoots, he would come to the video shoots. And we were like, hmm. And so eventually, it dawned on us, he was with Doc, and Doc knew where we was, because Doc was living with us at some point. And that's like when he started making his presence be felt. You know, because okay. he was representing Doc at the time. He was, and he was starting to be Doc's road manager at first, and then uh -huh. he became his actual manager. Okay. What What were people's thoughts about Suge during the time, or did people cool. not even no, pay Shug attention? Suge was a cool guy. So. Suge was one of the coolest dudes you could know back then. Okay. So I just, mean, super cool. I was scared of him. I would tell Dre, I was just go, cool. just, you know, I was very quiet back in those days. I didn't tell him, I just go, I just get a bad vibe, you mm -hmm. know. I didn't care for him. Uh, he was pro artist. He was always, you know, he, he was so cool that we end up, he started managing us in cocaine. Oh, really? Yeah. So you were managed yeah. by Suge Knight? Exactly, yeah, for about, maybe about three months. Suge needed to find out who made this all go. He knew Cube couldn't do it without Dre. Dre couldn't do it without Yella. So he, as dumb as people say he is, he's just stupid because he figured it out. Dre. So then the Easy e thing happened. No, that was at Death Row. We went to Rufus Records and got Drake contract from Jerry Heller. Okay. 
Jerry Heller and his bodyguards was there. Easy was lucky he wasn't there, but Easy kept his shit at home. So when we went into Ruthless Records and pretty much strong arm Jerry, mm -hmm. which he don't want to witch call him, but she'll, you go in there and talk to Jerry, I got these dudes right here, which is his bodyguards. So we sat out and waited for Suge to do what he had to do. Suge came out, Suge had a check, and he had paperwork for Dream and Chalet. Suge came in and, and the whole landscape kind of changed for us, like who was representing who, and, and, and Cube had just left, and all these question marks. And then I think the next person that really started drawing up the question marks was Doc, you know. And, and, and it was like, man, it ain't right, it ain't right. And then Doc had that big accident. Yeah, and he messed up his vocal cords. And he messed his voice up, and then yeah. it then it just got even deeper, and you know it just started turning into just like a total separation, you know, to where it became like Rufus was here and everybody was right here. The accident happened. You, your, your voice is, is hurt, but it seems like you're still in the group, and you know Dre is still fucking with you. Oh yeah. At what point do you think that things started to sort of crumble? When Cube left. Okay. Ice Cube leaves the group. Mm -hmm. Overall, what was the feeling in NWA at that point? Because you guys just lost a key person. Well, those guys was ready to mash forward. So then NWA starts working on 100 Miles and Running. Right. Okay, and, and what were the songs that you, you helped write on that album? Man. The track listing? Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. 100 Miles and Running? Yeah. Just Don't Bite It? Ran. Ran, yeah. Surprise, part two? No, they give me credit for that, but I can't remember. <laughs> Real, N-words? Yeah. Uh, commercial? Yeah. Okay, you're, you're, so you're all over this. Yeah. Thing. Okay. Well, Cube was gone. Were you involved in that? Yeah, I wrote the parts, some of Dre's and some of Easy's. I was a writer on it, yeah. Aha. There's never a main writer. Whoever writes the best, that's what we gonna use. Oh, so you guys will write the same We'll basically so, compete against each other for the verse, sure, in a way. Sure, sure. <laughs> sometimes you would win. Sometimes. That's how you get good, bro. Right. That's how you get good. I can remember Cube had to go back to the drawing board a few times. <laughs> <laughs> like, nah, bro. I mean, but, but so did I. And the drums, I, and the drums were my drums that dropped on 100 Miles and Running. They're out of my crate. <laughs> okay, so you were co-producing on it as well. Yeah, yeah, Ghost. Um, what was the feeling about Cube at this time? Because I think what America's Most Wanted was out by this time, or? Yeah. Yeah. Which, which, which was an incredible album. Great. That came out, I mean, were you guys basically like, all right, we're going we to diss Ice Cube and we're going to set this no. off? Or? No. We weren't like that. Okay. Even if, it, even if that's what happened, we weren't like that. Maybe a couple of those guys felt some kind of way. You know what I mean? But I like you. Were you writing any of the diss records towards Ice Cube during that time? No, I mean, generally, like, when 100 Miles of Running was done, it really wasn't, I, it wasn't targeted at that originally. It was just, like, more like everybody coming at us, so we just niggas running. We just niggas on the run. But there were you know? some Ice Cube disses. Oh, no, some jabs in there, no <laughs> doubt. And you yeah. wrote that? I didn't write that part. I wrote the easy part. I wrote part of Easy's and part of his. I can't remember what part okay. it was, but yeah. So, so Dre decided to throw that in. Yeah, all all the jabs and stuff. I mean, it, it kind of in reality, Vlad, it's like this. You know, everybody makes it seem like you know the breakup was like supposed to be like cool or that's never that's like an ex. You know what yeah. I mean? So I could see them feeling a little bitter because no one really felt like it was wrong at the particular moment. You know, no one thought like Jerry was underhanded. No, he's the only one who thought that. So he kind of was on his own. So it's kind of like if we all rolled like this, what's your problem? Um, the 100 Miles and Running yeah, the EP. Uh, EP came out and the Ice Cube thing was addressed. Oh, yeah. On that EP. So obviously people felt some type of way about it. I mean, that was after the... Uh, MT, the uh you know, the little D Barnes thing with the video. The D Barnes incident. Oh. Were you there when that happened? I was his girlfriend. I was at home. That was bad. Okay. So, Yella kind of explained it to me. He was there. Yella was there. Yes. I guess she let him say something, but they edited right before our part. So, Ice Cube kind of took the first shot. I 
don't know if it was taking the first shot, but it was made to look like a first shot. Well, I mean, where the made they edit it. I know. mean, if Ice Cube, he said, didn't say F in the. He didn't say it wasn't nothing like that. It was just something kind of simple, but it was put in edited where you know it looked like more than what it was. She tried to explain it and say it wasn't my fault. I don't have control over that. She wasn't so, but Dre, you know, he didn't think it was cool. And so he just thought that it just didn't look right, but she didn't have editing, you know? So mm -hmm. they made it look like it was him dissing, and in fact, he may not have been. And, and I guess D. Barnes got kicked down some stairs? Or? I, don't, I don't even I know. Don't know. I wasn't there. So you weren't there? I don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know. Fair enough. What exactly happened? Because the story's a little hazy. Oh, the story's not hazy. He just didn't want to say it. They were at a club, and he saw her, and he had a few too many, and he went straight for her. She ran in the girl's bathroom, and he went right after her, and he commenced to beating her. But she did get paid later. Do you know how much she got paid? No, but I heard it was enough to quit her job. So, once that happened, you guys decided to take the first shot in a song oh, yeah. against Ice Cube. Oh yeah. Did you were you guys seeing Ice Cube at all after that? Oh no. No, no. Never, not since the tour. Not since the tour. Yeah. 100 Miles and Running I thought was brilliant. Yeah. By the way, uh, I feel like people forget about that project. Yeah. I but mean, it was I, just like from the straight out of Compton it just yeah. like we grew up a little more. Yeah. Like Got a little older. Like personally, I actually liked that project more than the second album. Oh, okay. Just me personally. Yeah. You know, like I believe on that album, it was kind of addressing the whole FBI thing. I mean, 100 Miles and Running was about yeah. the FBI oh, yeah. and stuff like that. So we get a letter from Milt Ehlerich, who was the, um, I think, who was second or third in command at, at the FBI at the time, uh, talking about how F the police was responsible and Ruthless Records was responsible for the deaths of 89 law enforcement officers in America the year before. But I found out today from Phyllis Pollock that that letter was initiated because of pressure put on by Tipper Gore, who was then head of the PMRC or whatever that organization was. Phyllis says she has proof of that, you know, so I don't, I don't know. But um, we got it, and it was a very sobering kind of letter. Remember now, we're talking about the FBI, the most effective law enforcement agency in the world. But out of the blue comes our knight on a white horse, Donald Edwards, a Democrat from San Jose. But he came out and defended our First Amendment rights, and all of a sudden we felt, we felt better about it. Because look, I come from the 60s. I know all about conspiracies and Kennedys being assassinated and things like that. So this, you know, it was, while the guys didn't take it quite as seriously as I did, it was a very sobering letter that we got from from Mr. Ehlerich, the head of the, uh, you know, one of the head of, heads of the FBI. Um, but ultimately, nothing really happened with you guys. No one got arrested. No oh, one no, got charged. No, uh -uh, nothing. No. But now, easy. It was a different story. It was one night after doing the Arsenio Hall show. He was driving home on the freeway, going by the Coliseum in his brand new white 750. So he called me and he said. Oh, man, he said, I got these plain clothes guys following me. And I said to him, well, you're so paranoid. He said, look, I don't tell you about debits and credits. Don't start telling me about cops. And it turned out there were four plain clothes uh, cars and then some black and whites and then a uh, helicopter to close down the freeway. And the, the cop came, one of the cops came over the window. He said, uh, turn off the motor. And Easy said, uh, I'm not taking my hands off the wheel. But then some static happened on the phone, like it does on, on cells, you know, and the cops saw that and made, you know, and turned off the phone. So that was about as much as I heard. But they got him out of the car, face down on the freeway. They took him to uh, 77th Street on a uh, supposed charge of, uh, that, a, that a guy that looked just like him had just committed a drive-by shooting in Beverly Hills. Once I knew that he was in jail, he was cool. He just didn't ever want to go in there and not come out and not have anybody know about it. Once I, once he got me on the phone and I knew where he was, he was fine. They had him chained to a, to a cot there. Uh, 
They had him chained like he was a like he was a wild animal. And he was talking to me. He must have had the phone through the bars or whatever. He was talking to me, and the cop said to him, uh, "We know who you are, and you're never going to get out of here." He was. It was a great. Promo. He knows all rights. You know. Yeah. Freedom of speech is what they would say. Yeah. Right. What What was different about the second NWA album from the first one? Nothing was the same after Cube left. It was a different energy. We did it different. You know, uh, even the. the even the beats uh, seemed like they, they would have been better suited for a DLC record, you know. A lot of high-powered, fast-moving, uh, you know, nothing really dirty. Um, that was where the G-Funk kind of started, to, you know, with the synthesizers and everything else like that, I felt. Okay. I guess that's where the G-Funk started, you know. Layla and them like to say, well, Layla and them was around then, so yeah. I've said this all along that if it wasn't if there wasn't an NWA above the law would have been the biggest group on the west coast right yeah, yeah above the law big time too and look at look who wrote their songs 187 cocaine but they had a at ruthless they had a stand behind the owner of the company's group and you know NWA can i think Hutch is one of the most talented guys that I've ever met. And when it comes to the, the, the so-called West Coast sound and the true architects of that sound, yeah. there are some names that I feel like need to be mentioned along with the other big names from the West Coast <laughs> that help architect this sound. Yeah. One of those names is a young man that goes by the name of Laylaw, ladies right. and gentlemen. And the other one is Cole 187, a.k.a. Big Hutch <laughs> from above the law, ladies and gentlemen. The so. architects of that G Funk sound. Yeah, and KMG from, from Above the Law. Yes. Rest in peace. Yeah. Okay. He wrote a he wrote a verse and he said, uh, a key funk tape wakes me up every morning. Yeah. For whatever reason, I said, say G Funk. Right. We didn't know we was naming nothing. That's yeah. Right. He just put it in a rhyme, then we kept referring back to it, and then we realized it is G Funk. Mm -hmm. And then Pac when we were cutting, we were cutting um um uh, what wait, what year it? wait, wait, while you took it up, what year was that? 90? 90, okay, yes, okay, 90. Okay, okay. 1990. We're working on... Um, call It What You Want. Call It What You Want. Okay. I came yeah. down and Pac said it on a record, Black too. Black Mafia album. Yeah, yeah. Pac, Pac was the first time Pac said it. He said, what's y'all sound? What, what's y'all music called? We're like, well, we just call yeah, it G-Funk. Really we just, like, oh, we just call it G-Funk. So we uh -huh. said something to him, and so he right, wrote it right into his rhyme, G-Funk. Yeah, you know, he's whoa, the first whoa. that coined G-Funk on a record. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we really wasn't... The thing, when I created G-Funk, I was to be different than N.W.A. Because we cut Black Mafia Life at the same time we cut Niggas for Life. Okay. So it's the same thing now when the clicks broke. It was a lot of influence because I'm Drake. A lot of people don't know I'm Dr. Drake's understudy. I was yeah. this guy was that, his protege. I was his so, protege. Yes, yeah, yes. Wow. What was it like creating a, you know, you know, like the a second album? To me, the first album is better because of what it was. But sounding wise, musically wise, the last album is better. Niggas for Life is one of the biggest hip hop records that was ever made, you know. Yeah. And it showed you their stride, their rhythm was, you know, on point still, well, you know what I mean? Well, so, to be honest, that album did not have the amount of classic songs that Straight Outta Compton had. Of course. But the, the last album really got into the sound of the, and it was a great sound. Yeah. The sound was great. Straight Outta Compton was more popular, because I guess it was the beginning, yeah. really. But the, the last album was stronger, the songs was better, it just, Straight Outta Compton was a better album, even though musically it wasn't. They can't do Fuck the Police Part 2, 3, 5, and 7. They can't, you know what I mean? You okay. can't do that. I Fair mean, enough. it d doesn't make it as classic anymore. You're talking about to where NWA didn't fall off the map because Cube left. Absolutely not. That's what we're talking Absolutely about. Not. We're not going track 3 and track yeah. 5 and track 7. We're not doing that. Put we out a solid album. It exactly. went multi-platinum, I think. There you go. You know, again. And it came out at number one, you know, okay. ship number one, Okay. which is... I think to this day is rare. And yeah. no one ever in hip hop had that like number one on that hot 200 or whatever it was. Yeah. They broke records. And you guys dissed Ice Cube on that album? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, even, I don't even talk about them, you know, I don't even, that this stuff, I, I just stay away. Okay, fair I enough. Just... So what did you think when you first heard No Vaseline? Mm, I thought it was cool. You know, that's the thing about it. Nobody really got mad. It's just like, okay, he got us on that one. That's all, you know, I even told Cube this 
couple of months ago. I said, you get, uh, you, you got us. Right. You know, that's it. You know, we didn't like, oh, man, no. Nah. Nah, was- you know, I fuck with Cube all the way. And when no Vaseline came out, nigga, I rode with that. You know what I mean? That was the shit. <laughs> it's all about the song, man. It's a great song. <laughs> okay. Right, because he, he responded with no Vaseline. You hear it as the number one or number two greatest disc record of Gotta all time. Gotta be, man. So, you're co signing what Yellow said. Everyone, you know, everyone in NWA felt like, okay. Man, I, can't, I, I don't know what those guys <laughs> felt. All I know is I loved it. <laughs> you loved it. Absolutely. <laughs> Every freaking bit of it. How did Easy feel about it? I don't know. Because it was really it. mostly aimed at Easy. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't think he liked it very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Q's was good. I ain't gonna lie. His was good. His was good. But we never got it. We never, yeah, we never got a chance to do a whole record. See, he did a whole record. You think back, we didn't do a whole record like he did. We, because we broke up, you know. We never was like, we're gonna do a record on him. It was just like, we was doing Niggas for Life album. And, um, Drake, you know, came up with the idea to do a commercial, like a skit or whatever. Right. And he did that skit or whatever, and that was it. So once that album came out, did it feel like N.W.A. was starting to sort of break apart at that point? Or was it during the album? Or at what point do you think that things started to sort of crumble? When Cube left. But, but then Dre left. Yeah. After, after the second NWA album. We all follow Dre's rhythm. You know what I'm saying? What Dre wanted to do, that's what we all wanted to do. So when it started being like, even him start being down here and the label start being up here, that's when he start, it started being like that. And that kind of like was, that was kind of like when Niggas for Life got done and it started really tapering off. You know what I'm saying? And, it's, and they start going into the promotion of Niggas for Life. Like after probably doing the Appetite for Destruction video, it was pretty much over with. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Well, that's when it, when that album, when we finished mixing that album, the group was over. Really? Yeah. The group was done. Why? It was just, it just dissolved. Why? Ray went his way and that was it. The group but, was over. But Dre was still under contract. Oh, I don't know about, you know, contract. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but, but the group was over. That's when Suge Knight came right. and explained she, that okay. contract. He started, you know, at that point he cozied up to Dre. That's when it, that's when And he started showing him the contracts and so forth. He went and got an attorney, which you know is David Kenner. Yeah. And um, he, he taught him, he showed him how to, because you know, Kenner was not an entertainment, he was a criminal lawyer. He turned into an entertainment, didn't he, real quick. I'm an entertainer lawyer now. Right. And he, Although he still is a criminal lawyer. But, but I'm just saying, he, he learned that, that entertainment side yeah. really quickly. Sure. So he, um, he was teaching him, you know, explaining what, what it was. What was, you know, coming home from these meetings with, with, with Suge and Kenner and stuff like that, what was what was Dre's conversation like? What was he saying about Easy and the situation and so forth? Now he, we didn't talk about that. Dre thing with me was was I don't handle the business. I just do the music. Every time I question him, he said I don't I don't I don't do the the business. I do the I do the music, and I mm. just would shut up. It's money. Okay, so Dre was unhappy about the money situation. Yeah, yeah. he spoke as to you it, about as it. Should have been. He spoke to you about it. Sure. And and what what was. What what was stopping the situation from getting worked out? Because ultimately, that's not that's not something I'm privy to. I just know it didn't get worked out, okay. and so uh, Dre and I began to focus as a unit on other things. Uh, how did how did the whole thing come together with Suge and Dre and you and David Kenner? Did, is that something that you facilitated, or is that something that Suge facilitated? No. Kenner came much later. It was me, Suge, Dre, and a cat named Dick Griffey at first. Suge gets his $100,000 check. Right. Now he brings Dre and and the DOC. Right. You were there in that initial meeting? Yeah. I was there for all the meetings. What was the meeting like? The meeting was, so they came in, and and the meeting was... um, these are my guys and they're not being paid for what they do they leave 
Grimmy says, what do you think? I said, I can't believe that anybody would have produced that many records and they're not being paid. And so then Dick says, well, see what you can find out. I um, called around and said, oh yeah, they really did sell all these records. And you know, it really was happening. Um, and then um, there was a lawyer who worked for, um, for Ruthless. His name was Ira Selsky. And I said, Ira, I met with um, this kid, Dr. Dre, and he tells me that he doesn't have any contract with you guys. He says, well, he's part of the group NWA, and so Ruthless has an artist agreement. And I said, uh, do you have a producer agreement? They didn't have a producer agreement with him. And I said, do you have a publishing agreement? He says, no, we do like some single song contracts, but there's no producer deal with him. I mean, no, no songwriter deal with him. So they came back, and Griffey said to him, so look, son, you know, I'm not into your music, but if you can produce hit records like you're producing, you don't have to worry about getting paid. You can have your own company. And so um, it was out of those conversations that the idea of starting a record label was born. And uh, we decided we would do business together, and, and we started this thing. And so then I did a publishing deal for Dre to help fund the record company. I did a, a publishing deal again with Sony. Uh, and I think we gave Dre a million dollar advance for his publishing. Uh, and that was money that was going to be used to start Death Row. Well, before Death Row, there was Future Shock Records. You know. And it was called Funky Enough Records. No, Funky Enough was me and Shug's thing. Okay. Before this thing. Okay, so originally you and Suge were going to form Funky Enough Records. Right. And uh, the wreck happened. And now I'm starting this spiral. But when Dre fell into that situation with, with Easy, and we decided that we were going to take another route, then uh, it was it was easy to see that maybe I could pull myself out of this hole, right? So when Dre and I d d decided to uh, do this this label, it was called Future Shock. That's what Dre wanted to, to call it. Future Shock. Future Records. Shock. Records. Yeah. Or some okay. Future Shock Entertainment something. Okay. Future Shock began its transformation into Death Row. Okay. That's when Kenner came because there was a guy named Harry O. And Kenner came through that guy. At some point, Harry O came into the picture. Yeah. Um, what do you understand happened with that? Uh, it, it's fuzzy because you know the, what 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 ended up happening is you you were there when Death Row was essentially founded. Yeah. Okay. Sitting at the table. So you were there when Harry O and Shug first met. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I was in the room with him and David Kenner. I was in the room with Harry when he told David Kenner that he's gonna show him how to make more money in the music business than he ever made as a lawyer. Harry O was doing an album on Lydia, his wife. Right. So me and him sell these. I tell him, I say, look, you're doing an a, 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 a album on Lydia, you better use Dr. Dre on that album. You know him and Easy fell out. So Harry took that advice and started looking for Dr. Dre. And Shug Knight was his manager. Kenner brought Shug in to see me uh, due to my request after being told that uh, Shug was involved with uh, Dr. Dre. We decided to, to set up a company. I put up, you know, a $1.5 million investment until I brought Death Row into the equation. On paper, as a company, there was no Death Row. I actually set up GF Entertainment as a parent company and made Death Row a subsidiary and so there's a hundred percent ownership through my trust the name death row who came up yes, with it i did over the years a lot of people started saying oh i started i started but no i started it because of my situation so i sit around talking with the guys uh and they said we want to start a company uh and i said what do you want the company to be with future shock i, I incorporated future shock for them then they came back and said that's not hard enough. You know, we're going to be a street la label. We want to have something like Def Row, where there was already a trademark for a company called Def Row, D-E-F. Yeah. And it was owned by a producer named 
Andre Manuel. I think I paid him $25,000 to buy that name. Uh, and then, uh, and then we, we changed the name to Death Row Records. What I've come to, to understand that I didn't understand is that Kenner went to Suge and Harry O um, was, uh, put up a million dollars to be invested in Death Row and, and they created another company, Godfather or something like that. Okay. And all of that was not disclosed to me or Dick at the time it was happening. And that happened while they were still in our building. He but thought that he had bought half of Death Row. Okay, but in fact, it was a, some other spinoff company which had nothing associated with it. But the answer is, I, I you know, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay. you, you know, you know, this is where where you, where you get into only um, uh, Suge and David Kenner can perhaps answer that. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think, I, and and I've, I spoke with Harry. Oh, his view was that he was creating a company that was going to finance and own at least half if not more of Death Row Records. And that Death Row Records was going to be, uh, was a name that was going to be owned by Godfather Productions or something. Okay. So I talked to, to DOC. He said that originally when it was supposed to be Future Shock Records, Dre was a 35% owner. He was a 35% owner. Suge was a 15% owner. And Dick Griffey was a 15% owner. But when they sat down and did it, because I did the formation of the companies, Suge was the manager, and the idea was that Suge was going to get 15%. That left 85%. And what Griffey presented to the guy said, I will split the 85% with you 50-50, hmm. so that the, the deal was going to be 42 and a half for Doc and Dre and 42 and a half for Griffey okay. and 15% for Suge. Okay. That's how that's how, how it was formed. And there was no difference between Future Shock and Death Row. What happened is Future Shock or Death Future Shock became Death Row. Okay. But the DOC was no longer a part of Death Row. He was a part of Death Row when it because it all happened at the same time. In other words, we're talking about a matter of weeks, not not months. Okay. Um, and uh, what what then happened that became subject of, of a lawsuit is once, once the company got formed, Suge took the company to Interscope. And when he took the company to Interscope, he took control over everything and said, you're out. But that wasn't, that wasn't legally the case at all. Okay, but ultimately DOC was not an owner of Death Row. After. Ultimately DOC left. I, I oh, he think, left? Yeah, he, he left, went back to Texas. And, and I, I wasn't around once, once because when, when, the, when the company first started, if I don't know, for a series of months, they moved into the Solar building. Right. And that's where the Chronic was recorded. The Chronic was recorded in the Solar building. Yeah. And during that period of time, even though the name was changed from Future Shock to Death Row, Doc was still a, a, an, equity, an equity owner of the company. Okay. Yeah, he may not have understood it, but he was. So dur during this period, because you know, during the period of time they were in our, in, in our, in our building, in the Solar building, and recording, you know, not only the chronic, but some of the things that were on, on the deep cover soundtrack. Here's the kicker of all of that. The original roster at Death Row is Above the Law, DOC, Dr. Dre. Mm -hmm. And then Snoop and Warren G and them come up under us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Warren bought Snoop to us first when we were all at Ruthless. The, straight, the craziest thing about it is when Death Row actually started becoming Death Row, Warren G was just there. Snoop, Snoop hadn't actually came came to the click just just yet because we all had Ruthless still. Yeah. So it was gonna be it was gonna be a label off of Ruthless at the time when NWA was all together. It was gonna be a subsidiary label outside of Ruthless, you know, like a a, a, um, a, a sister label to Ruthless. And did he, was of, he, he knew about this at the time or? Yeah, he, he knew he, he knew that he knew that they wanted to he knew that, that Dre wanted to do his own label. You know, uh -huh. and then when Dre and when Dre and Shook came together, they were talking about, you know, they want to do a label. He's like, Well, let's just do it all together. So how did you find out that Dre had left? Oh, he told us. When he was when he was deciding to leave, he asked, you know, like when Suge asked me, he said, Would I come over with him and Dre to do death row? Um, they said they already had Doc to leave, commit to leave, and Michelle A commit to leave, can, you know, 
can we come with them? Sidebar. He's our Sidebar. Okay. Yeah. Like he say, he come up under us. He come up under Dre, us. Dre, Warren, brothers. Right. Dre, Warren be at the studio all the time. Mm -hmm. yep. Dre would um, go do his thing. Warren just be ass out at the studio sometimes. That's right. So he would leave with us and go home yeah. with us, sleep on our couch, be around us. Yeah. So he started playing his projects for us. He started playing right. 213 for us. He, yes. And, and we told him, we like we like the rapper, we like the singer, whatnot. Bring him by sometimes. Yeah. He brought Snoop up to the studio brought, one day. He brought Nate. And, 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 yeah. Rest in peace. And um, yeah. um, um, he was doing Call It What You Want that yeah. day. Mm -hmm. He made the beat. I bounced. Him and him and um, Snoop stayed. He did a song for Snoop called it, called it Day in the Life. Yeah. They left from our studio with that song. Went up to Dre House. Dre was having a bachelor party for L.A. Dre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the music stopped for a second. Warren threw the tape in. Played that song. Yep. L.A. Dre told Dre come listen to it. Yep. That's why he called him and signed Snoop. And when you first heard Snoop, what'd you think? It was incredible. Incredible. Yeah. You saw it right away. Right away. Snoop, got to realize, was starting to become developed by above the law. We was bringing him in and bringing up under our tutelage. But I think at that time, we was kind of like, okay, working. I think we was like so deep in the black mafia life at the time, I think. We was like, well, okay, we got to focus on this. So by the time that when we wanted to make our exit, they were still kind of floating around back and forth. So no, no, I, I, here's real talk, Sway. Here, here you go. Okay, I'm going to keep it 100 with you. Okay. I'm going to keep it 100 with you. Dre had an apartment right by my studio. Dre came over to my studio, sat in my room and said, sat there with his hands folded. He said, hey, man, I heard that kid Snoop. What y'all trying to do with him? He kind of hot. I want to do something with him. I said, do you. When we actually had to stay at Ruthless, because the only reason why Above the Law had to stay at Ruthless is because our contract was too new. Okay. We yeah. couldn't leave. If, if we would have went to death row, we would have never made a record for another four years. That's then when Deep Cover come out. Now, we all cool with each other. Now, listen to Deep Cover. Yeah, and you don't stop. Because it's 187 on the undercover car. Uh -huh. That's supposed to be me saying that. Uh -huh. But when the click split, they started working alongside Dre. We stayed and did us. That was oh, yeah, like they, they all came. Snoop. Daz, corrupt. We had all the, the, what, what we did was once we said, okay, once Grimmy said, hey, I'm going to be part of this company, what I will do is I will make available to you the whole third floor. We had third floor in our office building, it was a creative floor. It had um, a space that was a rehearsal space, it had, a, had the studio, it had a number of different small offices, which were like really production offices and stuff. That became the death row space. You guys decided you wanted to leave with Dre, but right. you had a contract that prevented you from leaving. Absolutely. Did you go to Easy and say, hey, we want to go with Dre? Yeah. <laughs> it was a big meeting. We all had a big meeting. So name all the artists in the city. Michelle team. A, DLC, Dr. Dre, and Above the Law. We all was in the meeting, in, in cocaine. Okay. Remember like it was yesterday, and Easy was like, you can do what you want to do, Dre. Doc, you can do what you want to do. Michelle A, you can do what you want to do. But I'm keeping Above the Law. We okay. have a group with a lot of potential. I feel like I can I can have another surgeon with my label with him, and that's not gonna happen. Well, how'd you feel when you heard that? Great. It okay. was at Dick Griffey Studio at Solar. Now it's the Edmonds Tower now. So they're working on the Chronic at this point. Working on Chronic and other stuff too. And other stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think like primarily the Chronic. Deep Cover, I think. Deep Cover. Deep Cover. They worked on the same time. What What happens? We did. We 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 had the opportunity to do the soundtrack for Deep Cover. And what we decided we would do is that would be a way to introduce the death row artists to the world. So on the deep cover soundtrack, about I think half the songs are from death row artists. So that was a solar record. Right. But it was the idea was Oh, oh that came out under a solar record. Yeah, you know, solar oh, record. Okay. That was a solar record. Gotcha. You know. Uh, and and so we put that record out. Just keep in mind Griffey had an, had an equity stake in Death Row. So, yeah. so we were using the Deep Cover soundtrack as a way of introducing the Death Row artists to the world. So that was cut at the same time they were working on the crime. Okay. Because when Easy decided to say he didn't want to do it like that, you know, Dre went on and Suge went on and created Death Row. Yeah. That's why if you if you notice on Deep Cover, me and me and Cocaine got a record on there called Nickel Slick Nigga, which I yeah. mean DJ Speak produced for Cocaine at Ruthless. That's on yeah. Deep Cover. 
because when we done the deep cover record, we still were together. You know, Kenner started coming around. Um, they even had a party at Chasen's and stuff. But none of, none of us from Solar were invited or were aware of what was going on. We had no idea that there was any involvement by Michael Harris or, or anyone. So. Just recently bought a studio. Over, tell me what you got like 48 tracks and stuff now. 56 tracks. Where did you come from to get 56 tracks? What did you um, do to get where you are now? Man? Work hard, hard work. I started on a four track in a garage in Compton, and just build it, build it up from there. That's about it. Thank you. The label started with uh, Dr. Dre who was going to do his own thing, and uh, with a lot of help from Suge Knight and uh, Harry O and a number of people, and we got it all together. Well, GF Entertainment is a multimedia company. We have Death Row Records. We have a mo movie production unit. Uh, concerts, we're going to be doing pay-per-view concerts and uh, all kinds of exciting things. Dre N.W. and all that, my homie Snoop, they premiering their new, you know, record company, their little project they got called Death Row Records, and all the performers, the groups going to perform tonight, you know. Death Row is going on here tonight, the new explosion of the most powerful record label to come out into the market that I've ever seen in my life. And I mean that. Death Row. Death Row. Death Row. That's right. The market we're going after, we, we're mainly for the people. I mean, for us, the West Coast, there's a lot of talent around that guys really don't have the opportunity and have a chance to prove themselves. So for as Jeff and the Tammy goes with the studio and the films, we're giving all the youngsters the opportunity from all the neighborhoods where basically we haven't forgot where we came from. What I'm doing right now is um, I'll be putting out a solo album soon. So the chronic is being put together. Mm -hmm. And then it gets shopped to various labels and Interscope ends up biting. Yes. So, so the, it, the context is always important. Sony was our partner for all things. Uh, and, and our idea was that Sony would become the distributor of Death Row Records. Right. But Dre is still signed to Eazy-E. As an artist. As an artist. Correct. And he is performing as an artist all over the chronic. Correct. You're saying that Easy was fine with Dre leaving, yeah. but Dre was still under contract. Right. When he decided that he was fine with him leaving was when Dre said he wanted to leave. See, people get under the misconception like how, okay, if I say I want to leave today, you can just walk out the door and leave and then there's no contracts. Like, it, you got to go through contracts. You got to get released. You got to go through all that. Okay. He, never did, he never said that I'm going to tie your shit up. So Easy was actually cool with it as long as he was compensated. Yeah. Okay. So then there is the whole story of how Suge met Easy in a hotel room and something happened where Easy signed off. Signed releases. Signed releases. But then the next day Easy came back and said this was done under duress. Correct. Were you familiar with the situation as it was happening? Wasn't familiar with it as it was happening. I was familiar with the need to get a release. That was kind of all around the same time. Okay. Because of because they were getting so they were getting so antsy about what they were trying to do with Death Row that they really couldn't do it and talk to anybody without having cl oh, proper clearance. Because Dre was still tied up exactly. with Ruthless and that deal wasn't worked out yet. Right. Okay, so Suge allegedly mm -hmm. took it upon himself right. to to force Easy to sign off on the contract. Right. Do you know that that situation was real? Yeah, that situation was real. And, and I won't get into that because I, I wasn't there. You weren't there. But I do know where talks were swirling around the office that, you know, he was going to apply pressure. All I can tell you is this, that Dr. Dre and Easy were very close. They had been friends for a long, long time. 
I never thought that anybody could come in between their relationship. And uh, Suge Knight did, and uh, he's a bad guy. You know, that's, that's what he did. You know, everybody knows about the incident. What happened was Dre called Easy to squash the problem that was going on, and he said, meet me over at Solar or whatever studio it was. I think it was Solar. And Dre wasn't there, but Suge was there with all those guys. And they had ball bats, and they had, you know, pipes. And they said, we got people in front of your mama's house, and we got Jerry Heller in a van. And if you don't sign these release forms to release Dr. Dre, Michelle A, and the DOC, you know, we're going to beat you to a pulp and kill them. And, of course, Suge's answer to that was that Easy just decided to do the right thing. You know, that's so ridiculous. Suge tried to destroy my record company with the help of others. There's no question that we have substantial documentary evidence of a conspiracy here. Eric Wright, Easy e filed a, a RICO lawsuit against them. It was the first time RICO had been used in the music business. Easy's lawsuit contended that there was money laundering, extortion, threats, and violent intimidation. Not only was it charged against Suge and Death Row for stealing what was their top producer, Dr. Dre, it was charged against Sony Music. Because of Easy's persistence, he had been wronged and he had been robbed for his artists. Sony chose not to be a part of the lawsuit. But there was an incident in which, uh, I think it was an Ice-T record, Cop Killer, uh, was kind of a hit record. There was a guy who killed a highway patrolman in Texas. Right. There was a big brouhaha that erupted. So all of a sudden, we had no distributor for the record. Okay. Um, and not enough money to distribute it on our own independently. So Dick started looking around for somebody that might become a distributor. And um, John McLean Jr. was an, uh, an A&R guy at Interscope at that point in time. And uh, Dick was close to the McLean family. And so he played the music for John Jr. And then John Jr. went back to, um, to Jimmy Ivey and said, I think I found something. And they offered Sugar a million dollars if we bring the record there. And that's how the chronic ended up going to Interscope. Well, I, I remember there was this, uh, this line from Easy e on Compton uh, City G's where he said, but Dre Day made Easy's payday. So ultimately, Easy ended up profiting from the chronic and other projects or, or just the chronic? I don't know. I don't, no, know. don't know. I don't know. Okay, but something got worked out. Yeah, something got worked out. You know, my advice had been, Hey, go talk to the guy, tell him you give him an override and stuff, you know, because you can't make an artist record. You can't make Dre go record with NWA. You can't make Dre go produce NWA. So they're going to get nothing. You know, it's better off for you to say, look, you're not going to get anything. Give us a release and we'll give you three point override on records and stuff we do. Now, whether they did that or not, I have no idea. Okay, you weren't involved in that at all. I wasn't involved in that. At okay. All. Dre came to my house one day. We lived right you know, right around the corner from each other. We all lived there together. And said, hey man, you picked the wrong nigga. And Doug Young, who was the head of promotion at Ruthless at the time, said, look, you better start taking Dre more seriously because, you know, this Suge Knight is really, is really blowing smoke up his ass. Yeah. I made his deal with Jimmy Ivey. Dre had a, a company that he was gonna call Def Row. And the, the title- D-E-F, right? The yeah. title Def Row was owned by Unknown DJ. So after he left, I had made a deal with him, with Irving Azoff and Mo Austin, but it was right about the time of um, Cop Killer. Yeah. So I had made a deal with them where Dre was going to get his own company and Easy and I were going to own 20% of it. I made that deal with Irving Azoff and Mo Austin. But... Mo Austin then backed off of hip hop and the deal fell apart and Suge was able to come in and try and make a deal with him first with Sony, with Hank Caldwell, and then wound up making, you know, wound up getting Interscope interested, Step Johnson, and uh, I, I wound up making that deal 
between us and Jimmy because Jimmy called me and he said, listen, Jerry, I will never buy a lawsuit with you, but I feel that Dre will never record for you again. I thought that was true, so I discussed it with Eric and I said, listen, Eric, you know, Interscope wants to make a deal with for us with Dre, and I believe Jimmy when he says that Dre is will never do anything for us again. So I did what I could to maintain and preserve the integrity of the of Dr. Dre, which was the assets that asset that we owned that we then sold to the Interscope. And of course, the, you know, it made Interscope what it is today and certainly has been okay for Dre too. So the chronic comes out, mm-hmm. goes through the roof. Right. Depending on who you talk to, there is a segment of the population that says that this is the greatest hip hop album ever made. <laughs> yeah. Hell 